All right, this is episode number 14 of the French Defense Speedrun series. We are playing against different players. Uh, we're going to do three different games in the rating range of 1900 up to 2000. Uh, this is the episode where we do finally get either crossing or very close to breaking the 2000 rating barrier, so that's very exciting. In this one, we're playing the French Defense, of course. Our opponent goes for d4 in move number two. We're playing d5 in response. Let's see what version we get. So our opponent goes for knight to d2. We are going to trade the pawns on e4, followed by playing the move bishop to d7, and we are going to be getting a Fort Knox variation. Uh, as I've mentioned in previous episodes, it does become a little bit more common to face the Fort Knox, uh, or to go for the Fort Knox where our opponent plays knight c3 or knight to d2 on move number three of the game. Um, the higher the rating barrier, or the higher the rating uh, category, you could say, the more common that this uh, setup tends to become. So white goes for knight f3 after uh, we play bishop to d7. We are continuing with bishop c6. Attacking the knight on e4. Here we go for the move knight to d7. Next we're going to put the other knight on the f6 square. And bishop to e3 is a little bit of an, uh, of an odd move in my opinion. It's not a bad move probably, but it does feel a little bit restricted. I mean the bishop is guarding the d4 pawn, but... Otherwise, the bishop is not really all that active on this particular location. Uh, I don't really see a reason not to just continue with our normal knight f6 uh, scheme of development. And if white takes the knight, we are going to recapture with the queen. And the knight goes back to c3. So this is, I guess, an interesting approach that white's going for. The drawback I would imagine to this approach of the bishop going to e3 and the knight going back to c3, first of all, white is blocking their c2 pawn. A lot of the times this pawn will be useful to play c3 to defend the d4 pawn or play c4 to gain more space. Um, the knight on c3 also can't really move forward at all, at least not very easily without you know being kicked backwards. Knight to b5, we can play a6 for instance. So white's pieces are developed but I wouldn't really say that they're on the most productive or useful locations. We can also at some point down the road play a move like knight to d5 to facilitate some extra piece trades. And generally speaking, because we're behind on space, trading pieces is uh, usually a pretty good thing to go for. So here I'm trying to decide which square I want to develop the bishop to. Do I want to play bishop to d6 or bishop to e7? You could kind of make a case for either one. You could also go bishop to b4. I also don't think that's too bad of a location either. Um, kind of leaning towards d6. White's pieces are a little less active than they might normally be, so I kind of like the idea of bishop to d6 myself. I think I'm going to go for that one. I can't imagine that bishop e7 or bishop to b4 are bad moves either. Uh, there is a possibility here of throwing in the move knight g4. This would attack the bishop as well as putting some pressure on the h2 pawn that white might have to be a little bit careful about. But I'm not necessarily in a... Well, let's see. This is... The more I'm looking at it, this is actually quite interesting because if white plays a move like pawn to h3, I can actually throw in the move bishop takes knight. And if the queen takes back, knight to h2 is a weird fork. It does attack the queen on f3 as well as the rook that's on the f1 square. That could be interesting. Uh, if white plays g3, then they have weakened the diagonal for the bishop, which is pretty good for us. It feels a little gimmicky. <laughs> to, to, is, a way I, is kind of a way I'm interpreting it. Um... But I also don't really see a reason why it would be bad at the same time. So I think I'm going to try this. Uh, I, I would not be surprised in the slightest once we do the game review later if it says like castling is maybe a better move objectively speaking. But I'm going to try this knight g4 move. A little bit gimmicky, but the idea is to threaten to take on f3. Maybe in, in hindsight, white's best move is to play like knight to e4. If they had done that, at the very least, I might still be able to take the bishop on e3 and gain the bishop pair. Uh, but h3, I had kind of anticipated this. I think I can take the knight followed by knight h2. And if they do take back with the pawn instead, then we can do stuff like take the bishop and check on g5. And I think this looks pretty good. So queen takes, knight h2 is my little tactical idea here. And if the pawn takes, we're going to take the bishop, 
Okay, yeah, so knight h2, making the fork. Black or white does pick up a pawn, no problem. We're going to take the rook here. Could also throw in the move rook b8, but maybe white takes the a pawn, I'm not sure. Let's at least grab the rook. And then probably I'll just get castled. Kind of surprising to take with the bishop. I mean, the bishop was pretty good on d3. I think taking with the rook would have been better. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm just going to go ahead and castle. No need to rush with rook to b8. I can also go queen to b8. Would be an interesting way of trading queens. I might actually go for that now, quite honestly. Let's go queen to b8. I am ahead the exchange. I have a rook versus my opponent's bishop. Uh, they, are up, they are up one pawn. But if I can trade pieces, then that's generally going to be a pretty good, uh, you could say, recipe for success. Uh, also, if white avoids the trade by retreating the queen, then we can take the pawn on b2, which attacks the rook and the pawn, uh, the rook and the knight. If, if the queen goes to e4, we'll have to defend mate, but knight f6 will guard the mate and hit the queen. So I think queen to b8 looks pretty good. I think this does guarantee a trade of pieces. Probably not the only good move in the position, but seems like a pretty solid one. He does retreat the queen, he has threatening checkmate, but I can deal with this as far as I can tell. Knight f6 gets the job done. The queen can go to h4. I take on b2, and then I'm attacking both the knight and the pawn, and that looks pretty good, I think. I think that will get the job done. So let's go here. And then we'll take on b2. We are threatening to take the rook, and it's not checkmate because white can block with their bishop, but it's pretty close. He moves the rook away, but we can take the knight in this circumstance. What we will have to be a little bit careful about is the move bishop g5, trying to eliminate the knight and then uh, deliver the checkmate. So I'd have to be a little bit careful about that, I will say. So if I take the knight, bishop g5, what to do there, what to do there. Hmm. Pawn to h6, it feels like white will take my knight on f6. And then once I take back, they'll take the pawn on h6 probably. And I do run into some king safety issues. That actually is a little bit tricky. So what do I do about this? Hmm. Okay, I think I can get away with taking the knight. I'm assuming bishop g5. I'm going to move the rook away uh, so that I can open up an escape square for my king. And I think that should defend. The question is, where do I want to move the rook to? Hmm. Do I want to go to e8, d8, b8? I don't think going to c8 makes any sense. b8 gets on an open file, but kind of traps the rook on a8 in the, uh, in the corner. So the question is e8 or d8. And it very well could matter which one. Feels like going to... I feel like e8 is probably the one I'm going to go for. Um, okay, I think I'm going to go for e8. And yeah, so the point is here, if he takes on h7, I can start to run the king. He takes this pawn instead. However, now I believe I can bring the bishop back to defend. This was part of my idea. And bishop to g7 will defend against the attack as far as I can tell. Maybe in hindsight, rook on d8 would be a little more useful to hit the d pawn. That might have been a little more useful now that I'm looking at it. g3 feels very passive though, so I think now... I think I'll go bishop g7 to keep the bishop around the king. Queen probably goes to h4 to hit the pawn, and then I think I can just push the pawn 
And I don't think I'm getting mated anymore. Even if he could somehow teleport the queen to h7, the king moving to f8 looks pretty safe. I think here I can just take the pawn and offer a trade of queens. Yeah, I think I can do this. There's no discovered checks with the bishop because the queen is in the way. And if he checks on h7, I'll move the king and no more checks that he can play. And if he moves the bishop, I can take the rook. So he needs to, if he's going to move the bishop, he has to contend with me aiming at the rook. Let's go rook to d8, I suppose. And yeah, we're just up a full rook in this position. Uh, so I just have to watch out for some slight little tricks I can try, but anywhere the bishop moves, I'll take the rook. I can check on d5. I can bring the queen back. Um, maybe here I'll play pawn to c5. Uh, here, let's do it this way. I think I'll give this check, and then I'll do pawn to c5, pawn to c4. That's what I'm leaning towards. If this bishop moves backwards, then I can play queen f5 and trade the queens. And white's queen can't really move out of the h7 square because it's, it's pretty much trapped there. So queen f5 guarantees the trade of queens. Now we're just up before rook. We're also attacking the bishop that's on e2. And yeah, just up before rook here. Uh, I think we could even just pitch this pawn. Not a big deal. Make that trade. Uh, let's go to the b2 square to attack the pawns. Just go here to hit the a pawn. Let's kick the bishop. Let's go after this guy. He takes the pawn. Now we have our own pass pawn. Push this. Uh, I can just move the rook away, and then we'll just push the c pawn. Uh, I guess we could go here. I want to push the pawn without letting the king get to the d2 square. Push that. Retreat the rook somewhere. Capture that. Go here. Take that if he pushes it. Take this. Swing over. Take this. Go here. And now we can just push the F pawn all the way down the board. No stalemates. Just make a queen, and we have lots of ways to deliver checkmate. Okay, so we got the win on this one. Uh, interesting game where we got to play our Fort Knox variation. So let's go ahead and jump into the game review, and we'll check that out. One, uh, we'll check that out here. All right, so we've got our game review board here. Uh, it looks like we played at a 94.2% accuracy compared to our opponent's 86.1. And you can see in the graph here, it was a pretty equal game. There was some big mistake that was made, and then pretty much from there, we were just completely winning uh, after that. So let's check it out. Let's go to the analysis. So e4, e6, d4, d5, knight to d2. We go for the exchange, develop the bishop, hit the, hit the knight, and the bishop to e3 move was the first move in the game that I felt was a little bit odd. Uh, it does say that it's, the computer says it's an excellent move. It must be totally fine for white to play this way, uh, but it is definitely not the most common move or, or one of the more common moves. I think if I use the explorer here, I wonder if this will work well with the, uh, with the way I have the screen share set up. Let me see. Yeah, so we, you can see here, uh, white's most common moves in the chess.com database is uh, to castle, to play queen e2, to play pawn to c3. Uh, these are kind of the main three moves that white will go for. Um, and bishop to e3 is going to be much further down the list somewhere. Um, so anyways, though, bishop e3 was the move that was played. We go for knight f6. Knight goes back to c3, which I also felt was a little bit odd, but white's position is pretty solid nonetheless. We developed our bishop to d6. And yeah, I was kind of curious as to if knight g4 was... Uh, a good move for or not. <laughs> it does say castling is right there at about the exact same evaluation as knight g4, but it does also say knight g4 is um, is one of the top moves nonetheless. So I'm actually pretty happy to see that uh, a little bit of creative play <laughs> um, it, it is fine to go for. So h3 uh, apparently is fine for white to do. I did go for bishop takes f3. I played knight h2. And apparently after all of this, white is actually still a little bit better. I, I didn't really feel that way during the game. I didn't think that white was completely lost by any means, but I didn't really get the gist that white was better in a position like this, or, or, or even slightly better. But white does start making some mistakes as things go on here. So we castle, uh, 
Bishop to d3 is a slight inaccuracy. Uh, I went for the move queen to b8. And queen to e4 is kind of the next inaccuracy that white makes. Knight f6 hits the queen. Queen h4 is a big blunder. And now after queen takes b2, now we are just uh, quite a bit better off in this position. Uh, apparently white should have brought the queen back to c6. That way they are protecting the knight that's on c3. And then if I take the pawn, which would not be good to do now, rook to b1, the queen has to move, and then my queen actually is going to get, uh, it's actually going to get trapped, interestingly enough. So queen to c6 would have actually been uh, the best move in the position. I should not take the pawn in this circumstance. Uh, hopefully during the game I would have recognized that that would be a big blunder, and that queen to b6 or some other move would have been better to go for. But queen to c6 was kind of white's only saving move in the position. After queen h4, we did grab the pawn, and taking the knight is the best move. I'm pretty happy to see that that's the case. I wasn't really 100% sure during the game, because it did feel like after queen takes c3 and bishop g5, it does look pretty dangerous. White is threatening to take the knight on f6 and then checkmate on h7. Um, and it does end up that some of the best moves in the position are to simply move the rook off of the f8 square, which is what we went for. We clear out the way for the king to run, uh, to run. Uh, and then, for instance, if white takes on h7, I was going to run the king towards the center, and then white has pretty much no more attack. And again, we're still up one rook, which is great. Uh, white decided to take on f6 instead, and bishop f8 is a very important move here. This follows the idea that if you don't have very many pieces defending your king and you are under some attack, you really need to bring pieces over there to protect. We move the rook to clear the way for the king. Now running the king isn't really... Apparently, king f8 is also a good move here, but it looks like bishop f8 is played in the game. Getting another piece near the king and keeping the king a bit safer gets the job done, and now we are firmly uh, firmly having a big advantage here. So the rest of the game, I think, is pretty clear-cut. We pick up a pawn. We go here. We check. Offer the trade of queens. The queens come off the board. And then here, the game is pretty much over. You can play just about anything since you're up a full rook. Um, I don't know if I play the most accurate moves here or every step of the way, but we do end up winning, you know, more material, and we eventually deliver the checkmate. So, uh, pretty interesting game here on this first one. Uh, let's go ahead and get into our second one now. All right, game number two here, playing against INC13, rated 1908 from uh, Indonesia here. E4, E6, D4, we're going for D5, of course, with our French defense. Let's see if white goes for... Okay, so it goes for knight to d2. I think the previous game we also had a Fort Knox variation, I believe. So we're going to go for that again here. We're going to make the exchange of pawns. We're going to go bishop to d7. Put the bishop on c6. Whoops. Bishop c6, knight d7, knight f6. And we will see how our opponent decides to play against uh, our Fort Knox. So bishop to d3, pretty common. Knight to d7. Knight f6, next move. Go over that. If knight takes, we have the move queen takes. A lot of people, uh, at least in some of the games I've been playing recently, they've been playing knight to g3. It is one of the more common moves at the higher levels, but let's see what white decides to go for here. They decide to go for rook to e1. Uh, the simplest thing to do here is just to exchange a bunch of pieces. So we're going to capture on e4, take another time, we're going to play knight f6 to attack the rook, and then we're going to play the move pawn to c5 to uh, chip away at the pawn that's on d4 in the center of the board. And ultimately, as soon as we get in the c5 pawn break, we're going to exchange these pawns, white space advantage is going to disappear, and then we're going to enter a pretty balanced position. Uh, we, we're going to have eliminated white space advantage, which is pretty good for us, and uh, that's what we're going for here. So white goes for the move bishop to g5. I think we can go ahead and simply take the pawn. If white takes with the queen, we're I think generally happy to exchange the queens. If white takes with the knight instead, we'll play bishop e7, we'll castle, and we'll take it from there. Now, one of the big uh, imbalances, you could say, that's going to occur in this kind of uh, middle game or end game, I guess it depends on how white recaptures, they decide to take with the queen. Um, I think I am going to exchange the queens. It is also possible to develop the bishop and not exchange, kind of wait for white to take us. But if I develop the bishop, white doesn't have to take us on d8. They could play 
queen h4, queen a4 check, different things like that. I think I'm just going to go for the exchange here. And uh, now we have to be a little bit careful. White does have more active pieces, pieces than us. I'm leaning towards the move bishop either to e7 or to c5. I'm not 100% sure which is better. Bishop e7, that way if white takes the knight, we can take back and don't mess our pawns up. The slight drawback of bishop e7, though, is that whenever we do end up castling, white may have a move like knight to f5 available, taking advantage of the pin on the e-file. If we compare this to the move bishop to c5, which attacks the knight, bishop c5 does give white the ability to take on f6 and double our pawns. I don't necessarily think that's the biggest problem in the world, uh, because we do gain the bishop versus knight uh, imbalance in that resulting position. Uh, which can be pretty good for us and as the game progresses. Um, so quite honestly, I'm not 100% sure which is better. Maybe it could be the case that both are perfectly good to go for. I don't really want to castle queenside. Uh, might be possible, but I don't, I don't know. I don't really feel like getting into a pin. And really, if we think about it, where we want the rooks, we want the rooks to be on c8 and d8. These are kind of the open file and the half open file that we have available. If we castle queenside, then the king is kind of taking up the square that a rook would like to be on. Um, so again, bishop c5 or bishop e7. I'm going to go for bishop e7. We can look at this with the game review afterwards. I'm a little bit curious if there's much of a difference between the two. Um, but yeah, either way, we're going to castle next move. And then we're going to try to get the rooks to the D and C files. And as I was saying earlier, I kind of stopped myself in the middle of it. But one of the biggest imbalances or differences between white and black in this type of position is going to be the pawn majorities for each player. So white has a pawn majority on the king side. They have three versus R2. In comparison, we have a pawn majority on the uh, on the king side ourselves, four versus three. Uh, nobody really has any weaknesses or anything like that. Um, I will say, in general, the uh, this probably favors. I'd probably say it favors white a tinge bit because usually a queen side pawn majority is a little bit further away from the location of the kings, assuming that we castle. And so if white does make a pass pawn over on the queen side, it's a little bit further from, from the kings in the endgame. Whereas if we make a pass pawn on the king side, it's a little bit closer towards the kings. But it's a very, a very, very small thing, I would say. Um, so white, uh, that being said, though, we do have the king side pawn majority, which we can work to use as the game goes on as well. So it is a, it's not a drawish position necessarily. It's equal material and equal pieces, but the difference in the pawn structure is kind of what gives the uh, gives the upcoming positions a little bit of character. Okay, so the question is, do I castle right away or do I do something different? Castling right away, I am still a little bit bothered by the move knight to f5. It is a little bit annoying, I will say. So it could be the case here that maybe I should start with the move rook to c8. It might be better to begin with that. Um, because if I go rook to c8, then I'm kind of hitting the c-pawn, and that way if the knight moves, I can take the pawn on c2. So... I also don't have to rush castling. I can also play a6. a6 is generally useful because the a6 and e6 pawns kind of keep the knight from moving forward. Uh, the knight's not able to move forward if I play the move a6 at some point. I think I'm going to begin with rook c8. That's the move I'm kind of leaning towards. And it's a little bit of a waiting move, you could say. I'm just improving a piece before I decide to commit myself to castling. If white moves the knight away, well, if they move the knight, I'll take the pawn most likely. Uh, but if they did move the knight and I couldn't take the pawn for whatever reason, then I would be able to castle without this knight f5 move being annoying. I might also be able to play knight to d5 at some point. That would uh, potentially exchange the bishops. And white plays a4, which doesn't feel like the right idea in my mind. Um, generally speaking, I think white should be trying to play something like b3 and c4. I don't think b3 is what they should rush for. Bishop to b4 can be a little bit annoying, but I do think in general white should be working to get the pawn up to the c4 square. 
because in in terms of using his majority on the queen side, he should be trying to use the pawn that has no. Uh, he should be trying to advance the pawn that has no kind of counterpart um, first or furthest up the board. What White would really like to do is something like c4, b4, oops, sorry, c4, b4, c5, b5, c6, take, take, and then they would have a pass pawn on the c file. Now, of course, that's not, you know, that's not going to happen right away. If c4, I would have just taken the pawn, but that's kind of the, the long-term game plan. a4 feels a little bit odd, uh, in my opinion. So I think I'll just go for a6. Let's, uh, let's do that. Uh, again, I'm just restricting the knight from moving. And again, I'm kind of holding off on the castling. Uh, so they do play pawn to b3. So maybe they're going to try to play c4. Uh, but one of the slight drawbacks here is it does soften up this square on c3. Maybe I can even plant a piece on the c3 square, which would be kind of annoying for my opponent. Um, however, if I go bishop b4, the rook moves... White is still back to threatening these knight f5 and bishop takes f6 moves, which are a little bit annoying. Um, so I think, though, what I am going to do, I think I am going to castle now. And now if white plays knight f5, I think I have the move bishop to b4 to attack the rook. Uh, alternatively, I can even take the knight and then take on c2 uh, at some point. So we're going to we're going to go ahead and get castled. We kind of have to make this move at some point. Rook to d8. And the knight is kind of stuck protecting the c2 pawn. Now the pawn's on c4, which is a little bit uh, of a better location. One of the drawbacks to this particular arrangement though for white, especially when the pawn is on a4, is that the b4 square is kind of firmly in my control. And also if I get the knight to c5, the pawn on b3 is a little bit of a little bit of a target, I would say. Now, this is going to be a little easier said than done to accomplish. If I move the knight, I lose the bishop, for instance. So I'm going to begin by just playing the move rook to d8. Uh, we'll start off with this. I can also throw in the move h6 just to see where white moves their bishop to. Um, I think I'll go rook to d8 first, probably h6 next move. And one of the things we're going to try to do here is try to show that the a4 move is a little bit out of place. Again, I'm going to try to hit the bishop. g3 feels a little bit odd to me as well. Let's go h6 and kick the bishop. Now it can't go back to h4 because I have the move g5. And once the bishop does move back this direction somewhere, um, then we can start considering this knight d7 to c5 maneuver to hit the b3 pawn. I can also throw in bishop to b4 if the bishop moves uh, backwards uh, as well. Could be an idea. So he does take the knight. I don't think that's all that great, though, because once we recapture, this knight doesn't really have a very good kind of support point in the position. And what we're going to try to do now is I'm considering this idea of b5. If I can play b5 and soften up the pawns, on the king side or on the queen side, that can be pretty useful. So b5, like if a bunch of pawns get exchanged, I can maybe, you know, I can go rook to b8 and pick the pawn up on b5 at some point. Um, not exactly. Mm, I'm gonna bring the king over first. I don't think there can be really anything wrong with that. Let's uh, let's go king e7. Just centralize the king here. The knight doesn't really have a great place to move to. I can now consider b5. It's a little bit more of a possibility, I'd say. I kind of want white to take me so that I can get on the open file. I would really like to play a move like rook to d3 to attack the, uh, the b3 pawn. Um, so... Okay, I'm going to throw in the move bishop c3. If white moves the rook to f1, g1, or h1, then the rook is just more passive. Okay, so the rook is just going to be a bit more passive. That's totally fine with me. And I might be able to start advancing the pawns f6, e5. I can maybe even start pushing my own uh, pawn majority here. Maybe f5, king f6, uh, something like that can be an idea. Uh, I do need to play a lot faster here, though. So let's go for f5, king f6, and then e5. That's kind of the, the idea here. 
I didn't want to go e5 right away because maybe, well, I guess it doesn't work. I, white could take and then pin me, but I did have the move king f6. So maybe e5 right away was actually a, a little bit better. But I can still try to play e5 and e4 and try to mobilize my own pawn majority, whereas white has a little bit of a harder time uh, using their pawn majority. So g4 is not a bad idea. I'm going to try to keep these pawns kind of hold, held together. I don't want to take on g4 because then my e-pawn becomes isolated. Um, I want to play e5, e4, and this is the pawn I really want to keep alive because this is my kind of main pass pawn that I can try to work towards advancing. White's main pass pawn is their c-pawn. Uh, but the nice thing is that I, I'm kind of holding white's c5 square under check pretty well. And with myself, I can now, uh, let's say, I can now move the king up to f6. The knight is kind of restricted. And then e5 is still my general plan here. Yep, so let's advance the pawn. If he takes on f5, we'll take back. We're going to try to play e4, and then the question is kind of where does this knight move to? Um, again, I don't really want to take on g4 because then my pawn becomes isolated. I'd really rather put the pawn on e4, have it supported by the f5 pawn, uh, and then maybe even e5, or sorry, e4, maybe f4, e3, take, take, something like that one day can create, excuse me, can create me a pass pawn on the, uh, on the e-file here. Does attack the bishop, I will drop back to b4, again kind of freezing his pawn majority. The knight also doesn't have a lot of places to go to. Uh, let's go for, I think we'll throw in the move e4 to poke the knight. Knight will probably go in the center. Then I can play king e5, move further up the board, or even pawn to f4. And again, I'm just trying to kind of mobilize my uh, my pawn majority and make it a little bit harder for white to uh, to find a good place for their pieces. I also wouldn't mind trading the bishop for the knight at the right time, especially if it allows me to get the rook in, uh, a bit more activated. So uh, let's go king e5, poke the knight. The knight, again, doesn't really have a great location to kind of plant itself on. Uh, I'll go bishop to c5. Let's keep the knight off of the e3 square. He does have b4 here, I will say, which is rather annoying. Uh, and then once I retreat the bishop, he can play c5, but then I think I can play f4, and I want to keep the knight off of e3. I don't want the knight to end up on the d5 squares, really what I w uh, want to avoid here. Also, if he goes b4 and then c5, uh, c5, I can maybe throw in the move a5, break down the b4 pawn that's protecting the c5 pawn, and uh, try to take it that way. Now, the fact that he's traded pawns on the uh, g file, this uh, or on the f5 square, does give me rook g8 checks. So maybe, okay, I'm going to continue to keep the king kind of restricted, as well as the knight being blocked out. Let's also just go a5. Again, completely uh, restrict the knight. If he goes rook d1, it's a big blunder. Here I can win material. I have the move f3 check. King goes here to guard the rook. And then I can play bishop takes f2 check. And we are going to be winning material here. So the king is getting diverted or pulled away, deflected, whatever word you want to use. I'll be able to take the rook on d1 next move once the king moves. And he ends up resigning. If I was him, I might have played it out because I only have 27 seconds on the clock, but it is a completely winning position. Once the king takes the bishop, we take the rook. We're up a pawn. We're up the exchange. The two pass pawns are very strong, and we are completely winning here. So uh, that's it for this one. Let's get into the game review, and we will check that out there. All right, we've got our game review here. So we played at a 91.4% accuracy compared to our opponent's 81.7%. And in terms of the graph, it looks like it was, you know, white starts off the opening and beginning of the game with a little advantage, gradually turned in our favor. We made some mistakes in here that must have gotten white a little bit more back in the game, but pretty much we were always better uh, once we took over the advantage in the first place. So let's check out the moves. So e4, e6, d4, d5, knight d2, trade the pawns. We go for our Fort Knox maneuver with bishop d7 to c6. Develop the knight, offer the trade. Objectively speaking, white's best moves are, you know, knight c3, knight g3. Those are not the most common moves at the at kind of the rating level that we're playing at, I would say. 
Uh, as you saw in the game, rookie one was played. Knight takes f6 is also relatively common. I think if we use the explorer here, uh, this is going to be like the, let's call it like master level moves uh, played in the database. Um, you know, if you're looking at the names in this list of, uh, in this list of games, you're seeing a bunch of very, very strong grandmasters here. Um, but yeah, the most popular moves at master level are knight g3, knight d2, queen e2. Um, you know, two of those moves, knight g3 and knight d2, are mainly because white's trying to keep pieces on the board. They do have a slight space advantage because of their d4 pawn, so they should be trying to keep pieces on the board. Uh, in the game, though, our opponent plays the move rookie one, which allows us to exchange uh, two pairs of pieces. We capture on e4 a couple of times, we attack the rook, and then we play c5. And for all intents and purposes, black is already, you know, equalizing and totally in the game here. White plays bishop g5, we took on d4, white took with the queen. Uh, we decide to exchange the queens, we develop the bishop to e7. I was not really sure during the game if bishop e7 or bishop c5 was better, and it ends up that they're both good. <laughs> uh, there's essentially no difference between them. Bishop e7, it says, is like minus 0.1, the longer the computer thinks. Bishop c5 is going to be essentially equal, you know, 0, 0, 0. The computers always give that kind of thing. So, okay, pretty much both moves are good. Bishop e7 is what I went for in the game. Then I played rook c8. And again, as I mentioned, uh, one of the biggest differences or imbalances between the two sides here is going to be the pawn structure. We have, again, a kingside pawn majority to our opponent's queenside pawn majority. And the big battle is going to be who can use that majority better. And as you saw in the game, I was able to eventually push the E and F pawns up the board. I did F5, eventually E5, E4, F4. I did F3, if you know, but I could have also played E3 if... The tactics didn't work out at the end of the game. Trying to make a pass pawn over on the king side, that was kind of my main game plan. And I kind of already have that game plan in mind from this position here. As soon as we have, have the queens traded and the minor, a couple minor pieces traded, the pawn structure is... Uh, understanding pawn structures, especially once you kind of get past the intermediate phase, uh, when you're kind of getting to the, let's say, like, a bit more advanced phase of things where, you know, people aren't making blunders in the openings or blunders in the game so much. When you have to outplay your opponents, understanding the pawn structures, uh, how to play around them, what the plans are, different things like that, become very, very important. And even though the computer says the position is very equal, it's a, a lot of the game is going to revolve around who understands the pawn structure better. And as we saw in the game, white never really got their pawn structure or got their pawn majority on the, on the queen side moving very far, whereas we were able to use our pawn majority uh, so we'll see how white could have done a better job of that as well. So we went rook c8, a4. Thought a4 was a little bit odd. Uh, apparently it's not m much of an much of an error, uh, but black is still a tiny bit better off in this position. So I played a6, b3, a, uh, castle. I was a little bit bothered by the knight f5 move, but I think I have bishop to b4. Yeah, that, that was the move I thought about during the game. Bishop to b4 to hit the rook. And part of the downside for white is because they made the move b3, they can't play c3 to counterattack the bishop here. For example, let's say I had done, let's say I castled here, and let's say knight f5, bishop to b4. Here, white's best move is to play c3 because they are attacking the bishop. We can take their knight, they get our bishop, um, you know, but both players end up with kind of not the best pawn structure, but we end up with a knight versus the opponent's bishop. And as we saw in the game, I was the one that had the bishop versus the opponent's knight. The bishop is going to be a little bit better in these positions where uh, there's been a bunch of pawns traded and it's a much more open position. So this would be a little bit of an advantage for white. So I wanted to avoid this. Um, you know, now if he plays knight f5, uh, c3 is not available. He didn't do that though. He played c4. We put the rook on the open file, uh, attack the bishop. And then I think this trade of bishop for knight on f6 is a bit more favorable for me. And you can see how it's slowly getting a little bit more and more in our favor at this point. We attack the knight that's on d4. We move the king a little bit closer towards the center. Never want to forget your king in the endgame. Um, I did go for bishop c3, which the computer does like at this point. Uh, and then I did play f5. I was thinking about e5 in the game as well. Yeah, apparently e5 is also totally fine to go for, but nice to see that f5 is one of the top two moves. And then, uh, then I went for g6 here, 
And I went for g6 mainly because I don't, first of all, I don't want to take on g4. It says that black is still very slightly better here, but the problem is I end up with an isolated uh, e pawn. And the problem with the isolated e pawn is how am I going to make this into a pass pawn? Even if I push it all the way up to e4, I can really never go to e3 anymore because I'm not going to be able to support the e3 square. Whereas if I can keep the f5 pawn alive, maybe one day I can play uh, e5, e4, kick the knight, f4, e3, take, take, and then that's where the pass pawn comes from. So um, white played knight h4, king f6, knight went back to f3, and we do see here that the best move according to the engine is to play e5, and again we're just mobilizing the pawn majority. He had the bishop, bishop went back, and the biggest issue for white is their pawn majority is pretty much crippled. They can't push to c5, they can't go a5, they can't really attack the bishop, and so white's pawns are frozen, whereas mine are rolling down the board very quickly. e4 was played. Uh, apparently f4 is the best move. I played king to e5 uh, in this position. And apparently white has a, a nice trick here. Uh, pawn to f4 is white's best move. If I take with the king, knight to e6 check is a very big fork. That's very bad for me. And if I take on facant, then white can take back with the knight. And now I do technically have the pass pawn on f uh, f4, but after something like pawn takes, pawn takes, it does also become uh, isolated at the same time, which is maybe not that great. Objectively, black is still a little bit better, but not as well off as we would have liked to have been. So after f4, uh, the best move for me would be to just retreat the king. Um, and I do still end up with the protected pass pawn, so it is still a better position for me, but... If we compare it to the game, you know, in the game I was able to uh, make the move pawn to f4 and start the pawns kind of rolling down the board a bit more. Um, that would have been, you know, better for, uh, it would have been better for white to play that pawn to f4 check. Now here I played bishop to c5, and I did say during the game maybe white has the chance to play b4 here. In hindsight, bishop to d2 is a better way of doing things. We hit the rook and we keep the knight off the e3 square. And once the rook moves, then we can play f4. This would have been a better way of doing things for sure. No no question about it. Because then I can play uh, maybe e3. Um, rook to d3 also looks good. Black has a very nice position. The pieces are just much more active than whites. So bishop c5 was a bit of an, uh, of an inaccuracy. I did say during the game that if white attacked the bishop, I think I was going to play bishop a7. And then if white plays c5, I was mentioning that maybe the move a5 is working here. Um, with the plan that if white takes the pawn, we can take the pawn on c5. It is still a position that's better for black in the grand scheme of things, but apparently white's not as much worse off as they could have been. Anyways, though, he played uh, pawn takes on f5. We take back. And then he played king f1. Uh, he did not play the move pawn to b4. And now I played the move, uh, I did play f4, sorry. I could have played a5 right away, but I did that a move later. Uh, apparently f3 is even better to give a check right away. I played a5 because I didn't want to let white play the move b4 anymore. And white should definitely play the move f3. Uh, this would have actually made my life a bit more difficult because even if I do play the move e3 and get the pass pawn, it's going to be very, very difficult to actually kick the king off of the e2 square. And so it's going to actually be pretty hard to use the pass pawn once white is blockading it. In the game, though, he traded rooks. We take back. Uh, he played rook d1. This was a tactical mistake. I check with f3, take on f2. If he takes the bishop, we take the rook on d1, and it is game over at this point. So I think this was a really nice game that showed the importance of uh, you know understanding the pawn structure that you have, whether it's a middle game or an end game. The biggest thing here was this difference in pawn majorities for each player. And note that the computer says it's an equal position. It's not like I was better because I had the king side majority or white was better because they had the queen side majority. It is an equal position, but a lot of the gameplay is going to revolve around who can play around that pawn structure or that pawn majority better. White never really played around it very well. I did move my king side pawns down the board. That's part of what helped me to win the game. And uh, yeah, so. That's it for the second game. Let's go ahead and get into our third one. All right, we got our third game uh, playing the French defense here. We're playing against Tiago Varela, I guess is how you say the name. Uh, rated 2025 from Argentina. So e4, e6. Our opponent goes for c4. So a pretty rare option, I will say. Um, we are still going to continue with our d5 move. 
And the idea here is, I'm assuming white's going to exchange, you know, all the pawns on d5. And inevitably, if that if all those exchanges occur, white is going to be left over with the isolated d2 pawn, which they very well may move up to the d4 square. Um, now, the question is, do we want to take with the queen right away, or do we want to play something like knight f6 and take with the knight instead? I'm kind of leaning towards taking with the knight. There are some ways that white can kind of make this a little bit trickier to accomplish. So if we go knight f6, if white just develops the knight or, you know, doesn't really do anything to bother us, we'll just play knight takes d5, and I think we have a totally good position. White could throw in the move bishop e5 check. We would have to block on d7 with one of our pieces, and then they can go back to the c4 square, and that gets a little bit annoying for us in terms of recapturing the pawn on d5, because the bishop or knight on d7 would block the queen from hitting the d5 pawn. Um... But usually the way you can work around that is you'll, you'll block with the knight, and then if they defend the pawn, you'll eventually play knight to b6 down the road and then take the pawn back. You might not win it back right away, but you'll usually go like knight d7, develop the bishop, castle, and then knight b6 and take the pawn back. So I am going to go knight f6 here. I would really rather not take with the queen because I just don't want to get kicked around. And if white plays bishop c4 to protect the pawn, I think we can just go ahead and take the pawn as far as I'm aware. Uh, I guess white can play queen f3, but then we have bishop e6 to defend everything. I think that works out fine. Yeah, I think that works out fine. I'm just, I'm just kind of checking in my mind. Um, we could also just develop castle and then go pick the pawn up with that typical knight d7 to b6 idea. I'm just trying to make sure that there's no, like, tricks I'm walking into here. If I take the pawn, is queen f3 or queen b3 a problem? Um, if I take the pawn, queen b3, I guess I have pawn to c6. There is knight c3 there, which is, I will say, rather annoying. So what I'm going to do here, it might be fine to take the pawn. I'm actually not 100% sure. What I am going to do here is actually just develop and win the pawn back later. That's that's what I'm going to go for in this case. So I'm going to go bishop e7, castle, and then if he does protect the pawn, I'm going to maneuver to pick it up later. It's going to be pretty hard, I think, in the grand scheme of things for white to hold onto this pawn forever. Um, there are ways to do it, but they're also going to come with some drawbacks at the same time, I would say. So, yeah, I'm going to go for this route. Let's castle the king. I think queen f3 is probably white's best move. Knight f3, I will start the maneuver to attacking the bishop as well as the pawn. Queen f3, I think, is the best move because it helps to protect the pawn. Knight e2 is actually also a very reasonable idea because maybe you can play knight f4 to defend the pawn. But I think we're just going to stick with our idea, knight to d7. The plan is to play knight b6 to hit the pawn and the bishop. If he castles, for example, I'll play knight b6 and then... You know, once the bishop is defended or moved away, then I can take the pawn on d5, and then I'm doing totally fine there. So that's what he goes for. I think knight f4, if we're clicking back a move, I think knight f4 is maybe a better option, but then the downside is I still go knight b6, I go bishop d6, I go rook e8 check, and the fact that he's not castled, I think, would become a bit of an issue. So he needs to deal with the bishop being hit. He can play queen b3, I will say. That does help to protect the pawn and guards the bishop. Might be white's best move if they don't want to lose the d5 pawn. Uh, excuse me, but he does decide to retreat the bishop. I think we're going to take... Uh, which knight do we want to take? Um, kind of leaning towards the f6 knight for some reason. Trying to kind of figure out how to express the reason, though. Kind of like the idea of the bishop being opened up to the f6 square. The problem, though, is if, if I, you know, if I use the f6 knight, the knight on b6 is kind of just not doing a whole lot. Okay, I think I'll use the b knight. This is probably one of those positions where it doesn't really make a huge difference which piece we take with. So... Leaving the knight on b6 where it's restricted by the bishop doesn't seem fantastic, so I'll just use the b6 knight to take since the knight wasn't doing much else on the b6 square. 
Okay, white plays d4. So I will say, to white's credit, it is probably best for them to not start making exchanges of pieces because when you do end up with the isolated d4 uh, pawn, you want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. Um, if white had made the trade of knights, that would be one less pair of pieces on the board, which does favor black a little bit more in these positions because when your opponent has an isolated d pawn or really any kind of weak pawn structure in general, the less pieces there are on the board, uh, the less kind of dynamic counterplay the opponent can can create um, with the you know fewer pieces on the board, less dynamics, generally speaking, is how that tends to work out. Um, so it is a position where white has a little more space than us, and you could maybe argue slightly more active pieces. I don't really know if I would say that, though, here. Um, but they do have more space. The drawback for white, though, is that the d4 pawn is isolated. It is a long-term weakness. And white needs to try to make up for that long-term weakness by getting some kind of, like, short to medium-term attack. Um, the problem, though, is I don't think white's pieces are very well arranged for attacking. This knight should probably be on the e5 square, and this bishop should be on c2 trying to help attack the king. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play the move bishop f5. Uh, I think that this is fine to go for. Um, let's see, bishop f5. I can also go bishop e6. That might even be slightly better. I think white would play bishop to c2, though. Okay, I'm going to go bishop f5. I don't think there's anything really wrong with this. I can always go back to e6 later if necessary. But here with the bishop on f5, if he plays bishop c2 at any point, I'm happy to trade pieces. Now, a certain trade of pieces I'm not in a rush to do is knight takes knight on c3. The main reason I'm not in a rush for that particular trade is because white could take back with the pawn, and then the pawn on d4 is no longer isolated. So I'd rather wait for white to take me than me to take white, is what it comes down to here. So he goes bishop g5. Uh, potentially we can facilitate some more peace trades, uh, which we are generally happy to do. So I could play h6, for example. I think I'm going to play c6 first mainly just to reinforce the knight a little bit better. I also don't think there's anything wrong with h6, but I'm going to play c6 first, and let's see what white decides to do. Probably I will play h6 soon, and if white starts trading pieces, that's going to be pretty good for me. Um, so they play rook e1. Seems reasonable. Let's throw in the move h6 just to see what white does. If they retreat the bishop to the, uh, to the h4 square... Um, then the knight can never really go to g3 without being worried about some g5 moves. Also, the fact of having h6 on the board means if white ever does play knight g3, my bishop has a little bit more of a retreat square to drop back to. So probably white's best moves are either bishop h4 or bishop d2. I have a feeling... Okay, he does play bishop h4. I was going to say, I have a feeling he's going to take the knight, but okay. To, uh, I don't think he should be taking the knight. To his credit, he does uh, retreat the bishop. I'm going to go for the move rook to e8, just to protect my bishop and line up towards white's knight. And now knight g3, again, is not really much of a problem, because we can always retreat the bishop. He goes for it anyways, okay. Uh, like, what white has to now be worried about is the move g5. That's kind of what I was getting at here a little bit. Now, I can't go there now, he would take my, my bishop. So I need to save the bishop first. Um... I could throw in the move bishop g4 just to poke the queen. And depending on where the queen goes, then we have the move g5 to, you know, um, to trap the bishop. If he plays pawn to f3, then we can drop the bishop back to e6. And I kind of like the fact that we encouraged white to play f3. It does weaken some squares a little bit, as well as the king. Or I can drop back to e6 right away, or even back to h7 right away. Um... This, the drawback of the bishop on e6, I will say, is that my knight kind of becomes a bit frozen, because if my knight ends up moving, white can take the bishop and kind of mess up my pawns. So that's a slight drawback there. For that reason, I think I'm going to go all the way back to h7. I am hinting at the g5 trap, but I'm also kind of keeping the bishop still off of the c2 square. I will also point that out. If I went bishop to e6, he could move the bishop to c2, and then the bishop is on a pretty good diagonal. So he takes my knight. I'm going to recapture with the knight. Uh, 
And I think we're just gonna have a bunch of pieces get traded here. And the trade of, again, as I mentioned earlier, the trades of pieces are going to favor black more than they're gonna favor white. Uh, mainly because in the long run, this D4, uh, this D4 pawn is a long-term problem. Uh, here white takes with the bishop. Now I don't wanna take with my queen and lose my bishop on E7. And I also don't really wanna take with the pawn because then after all the pieces get traded, we kind of both end up with isolated D pawns. So instead of taking this bishop, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to take his um, bishop on h4. Now there is a, t is there a tactic here? There's almost a tactic here for white. I'm, I didn't really do, a, <laughs> I didn't do a blender check. It almost works for white to take the rook and then take f7. If I had to take with the king, he would have queen h5 check, but I, if he took on f7, I could take with the queen. So that doesn't actually work the way white would want it to. Um, and now white is left with an isolated deep one, less pieces on the board, and we also have the pair of bishops at the same time, which is generally pretty nice. Um, so what do I want to do here? I'm thinking about just playing rook to d8, just to kind of targeting the pawn. That looks to be pretty good. I don't see why not. Then I can play bishop f6 and pile up on the d4 pawn. Again, this is the weakness in white's position in the long run, and this is kind of the the problem, you know, for their position, you could say. Uh, the bishop on b3 cannot really help to protect this. If I put the bishop on f6, he's going to have to be kind of passive with a move like knight to e2. Like right now, if I go bishop f6 and queen d7, it's pretty hard to guard this pawn, I will say. So do, does it matter which move order I go for? I could even throw in bishop g5 first. I kind of like the look of bishop g5 first, but may not really end up making a huge difference. Um, okay, I think I'm gonna, I need to play quicker here. I'm gonna go for, let's go bishop f6. I guess we'll begin with this one. In order to guard this, he has to play knight e2 as far as I can tell. He could play d5. But after I take the pawn, my bishop is open, my bishops are both open. I, I think white runs into some trouble there. So I think he has to bring the knight back to protect it. And then the knight is just more passive on the e2 square. And then after knight e2, maybe I can even go queen e4 instead of queen d7. Queen e4 looks a little more active. He plays rook to e1. I think though, after queen to d7, I don't see a way to protect this pawn. I think I'm just going to play bishop takes d4 next move. Now I do have to be a little bit careful about some back rank issues. I don't want to do queen takes d4 and then rook takes d4 because then rook to e8 would be checkmate. So I may have to play king f8 at some point just to avoid the back rank problems. But I'm not really in a rush to do that yet because queen b4 check would be annoying. The main thing I want to do now is just take the pawn. It's, it's really just what it is. I might also play bishop g6. That way the king can go to the h7 square. So knight e2 uh, plays rook d1. Okay, so here I think I can just take with the queen. Uh, I think that that's fine to do. Just making sure there's no tactics. I think we'll just do that. And I would be pretty happy to trade pieces at this point. Take with the rook, take with the bishop, pawn on b2 as a target. I do have to be a little bit careful once again about back rank issues. But I think here it might be white who's running into the back rank problems. Like, I think I can just take this rook, right? Take the rook. He's not getting mated. He does have knight f1. But now I play bishop to d3. And now it's me that's threatening the mate. No back rank uh, problems myself. And once I take the knight, once I take the knight, then I have a rook and two bishops versus the queen. And that's just a material advantage there. So let's take with the rook. I think I can also take here on f2. I don't think there's any forks. Then bishop to e4 to hit this pawn. Rook takes b2 next move. If he takes the pawn on a7, I'll take the pawn on b2, and then everything's pretty well supported. And then I can try to attack the g2 pawn afterwards. So, yeah, we only have 30 seconds on the clock, but it's pretty much a winning advantage. I can just take this pawn, bishop e4 next. This check on d8 is covered, so that's not a problem. 
And I can also start to push the C point, C5, C4, C3. That's also a pretty good idea as well. I can check and then push the pawn. Uh, we can also just check right away, and once the king goes in the corner, then bishop to e4 is going to be checkmate. And that's that. We get the checkmate, and we get the win. Alright, so uh, let's go ahead and jump into the game review and take a look at the game. I think the biggest thing for this one, similar to the previous game, is going to be a big focus on the pawn structure in the middle game. Uh, so let's go ahead and check that out in the game review. Alright, so in this game review here, it looks like we played at a 95.6% accuracy uh, compared to our opponent's 78.9. Not really sure why it's not showing the names above and below the boards, but uh, yeah, so we got the win there. We had one brilliant move, which, uh, which we'll take a look at. Two inaccuracies, but for the most part, I think a pretty well played game. Pretty equal for quite a while, and then we slightly got some slight advantage. Opponent made a big mistake somewhere in there, and we eventually got the win. So let's check it out. So we play uh, e6, again, uh, and then yeah, white goes for this move c4. This is apparently called the Steiner variation, and we don't really need to deviate from our typical d5 move in the French defense on move number two. So we still play d5. Pawns get traded. I played knight f6. I, I prefer to take on d5 with like a minor piece instead of the queen. If we do take with the queen, white can kick the queen around. Um, this would kind of be like a Scandinavian defense, and I guess it is fine for black. White does still end up with the isolated pawn, but they also get a slight lead in development at the same time. And after, you know, if I play knight f6, white checks, I block. Uh, apparently this is maybe not the best version of things, though I would for sure make the argument that black is still doing totally fine. Um, it's the same kind of pawn structure as we saw in the game anyways, but I think black's pieces, especially the queen, feels a little bit misplaced. I don't think the queen should be on the a5 square. So instead, though, I played knight f6. I would like to recapture the pawn with a piece. He played bishop c4. Uh, apparently, taking the pawn is fine to do. I was a little bit bothered by queen f3 and queen b3 ideas. I thought maybe queen to b3. Uh, okay, apparently queen e7 check is strong. I didn't, I didn't think about that during the game. Uh, you check, you guard the pawn, and then you can move the knight now that the pawn on f7 is protected. So that's that's a, a good little uh, idea to be aware of. And if white plays queen f3, then apparently bishop e6 is fine. I thought maybe knight c3, knight to b4. Okay, I wasn't thinking about knight to b4 in the game, but apparently knight to b4 threatened the fork, threatened the bishop, and after some trade of pieces, apparently black is better here still looks slightly messy. You'd have to calculate, like, knight takes this. Apparently, knight to c6 is an important move. You're threatening rook b8 to trap the queen. Okay, so that's, you know, uh, that's a lot of calculation there for such an early part of the game. I just decided to develop the bishop, and it does allow white to hold on to the pawn for a little while, uh, but I did eventually get the pawn back. And as I said during the game, I do think white's best move, I, I thought their best move was queen to b3 trying to guard the bishop and keep the pawn defended. Uh, but black is going to get good compensation. We can take the bishop. We can play a6, b5, bishop to b7. And again, it's going to be pretty hard for white to hold on to the pawn in the long run. Also, b5, b4, kick the knight and take the pawn is good. This is kind of similar to... I'm pretty sure there's some Alapin variations of the Sicilian defense. Where something like this happens. Um, I think maybe also, maybe it's not the Sicilian, sorry, it's like, oh, it's, it's the Panoff variation of the uh, Karokan, I believe, uh, where some stuff like this happens, except instead of missing your E-pawn, you're missing your C-pawn because your pawn took on D5. Something like that. Somebody in the comments can can tell me if, if they know what I'm talking about. I'm not going to dive into Karokan theory here, but anyways, they played Bishop to B3. We recapture the pawn. And the biggest thing that occurs, I'd say, in this position is the pawn structure once again. The pawn formation that each player has. White has the isolated d4 pawn. We don't. <laughs> um, white, that, that isolated pawn does give white a space advantage. They do have the only pawn in the center of the board. But at the same time, it's also a liability in the long run because it is isolated and needs pieces to protect it. So this is both a strength and a weakness. Uh, good things about it, bad things about it. And it really, again, does depend on how each player plays around it. It's, in, in that regard, the, the previous game, 
was very, very similar. It was not an isolated pawn structure, but we, the middle game and the second game that we just uh, played previously was all about the pawn structure. How do we play around it? The majority for white, the majority for black, minorities. If you understand how to play around these pawn structures, that can really uh, make your life a lot easier if you know what to do and what not to do, especially if you know what to do for both players. If, you know, as black, I know what I should be doing here. Against the isolated pawn, you want to blockade the pawn, you want to exchange pieces, you want to get closer to the end game. You do want to keep rooks and queens on the board usually because they can pile up along the D file to attack the isolated pawn. And we also want to try to defend against white's potential attacks and threats that they make. On the other side of the board, if we flip it real quick, white should be trying to use their space advantage, use their kind of, let's say, better piece mobility, and they should be trying to attack over in the king's side direction a lot of the time. If they're not able to make an attack work, another alternative plan is to try to advance the d-pawn forward and trade it off and get rid of it. But that's always a little bit easier said than done when black is blockading the pawn in the first place. Now, the reason that I think that black, even though the computer says it's an equal position, the reason I think that black actually has an easier time with this particular setup is because, as I mentioned during the game, white doesn't really have the most aggressively placed pieces here. I said during the game that this knight should be on e5, this bishop should be on c2. What white should be trying to do is create some attack over in the king's side direction. But the knight on e2 is kind of passive, and the bishop on b3 is not really aiming at the king's side. It's, it's hitting the knight on d5 that we're going to kind of keep planted in place. So my game plan as black was to develop, guard the knight, you know, get the pieces untangled, trade some stuff, eventually pile up on the pawn on, on the d file. And that's essentially what happened as the game went on. So bishop f5 I like because now if white plays bishop c2, I'm happy to trade pieces. Uh, he played bishop g5. I played pawn to c6 to reinforce the knight. And if white does start trading pieces here, you know, let's say they take my knight, I take back. I want to keep in mind that I don't really want to take with the pawn because then we both end up with isolated pawns. There's really no need to give myself my own weakness. I'd rather take with the knight. And if white does take on e7, I think it's pretty important to take back with the knight in this position, because if you take with the queen, you are giving white the ability to take the knight, and once again, you end up with the same pawn structure. Um, the bishop is not actually all that much better than the knight in this position, because this bishop is kind of restricted by the pawn, and it can never really attack white's weak pawn. So that was what I was trying to avoid in the game uh, at one point. Um, so... As things progressed, white played rook e1, I hit the bishop, they retreated, played rook e8, uh, and then after knight g3, apparently bishop e6 is the strongest move, bishop g4 is also good. I went for bishop h7, this apparently is an inaccuracy, and it looks like it does give white the ability to exchange a couple extra pieces in a way that they would not normally be able to do. So bishop takes d5 here was, was not a good move for white. They should have gone ahead and taken on e7. Uh, I don't want to take with, you know, okay, first let's say we take with the rook, he takes back. Again, I'm not crazy about taking with the queen because white's still going to take the knight and we get that same kind of mirror image pawn structure where my bishop is not actually able to target anything. If I take with the knight though, the slight drawback is after queen f3 specifically, it's actually a little bit tricky to deal with some of the pressure. And even if we do protect, uh, like white can go h4, h5, and it's actually white's active pieces that are kind of making up for their weak pawn structure. And that's what I said earlier, white needs to kind of compensate or make up for their weak pawn on d4 by attacking, activating their pieces, making threats. Because again, the longer the game goes on, the weaker this pawn becomes, the less pieces on the board, the less threats I have to worry about. And the way the game went kind of showed that. So. White did have a little bit of a better opportunity to play here, but he played bishop takes d5, we take on h4, more pieces get traded, and pretty much now we are just firmly in the driver's seat. We are just uh, having the bishop pair, the better pawn structure, the more active pieces now, and we're just doing well. White went queen to d2, which apparently is their best move. I didn't really, I'm not entirely sure why that's like their only good move, but okay, queen to d2. I went bishop f6 to target the pawn. Rook e1, queen to d7, and for all intents and purposes, the pawn on d4 is pretty much uh, a goner. Apparently, white can play d5 
And I think the idea here is if I take the pawn, it looks like they can play queen takes d5, and I cannot take the bishop because of the back rank problem. But even a position like this should still be a little bit better for black because of the bishop pair in the white open position. But I will say, from white's perspective, if they did do this, they would have been able to trade off their weak isolated pawn. So black is a little bit better, but it, it's a little harder to prove that advantage because there's no weak pawn in the center of the board to attack. So as I said earlier on, one of the key plans when you have the isolated pawn is you want to try to advance the pawn and trade it off. Um, now that there's no piece blocking the pawn, pushing it is available. And it works out in this position for tactical reasons because of the back rank issues. Uh, even though black would still be better even if white pushed the pawn. In the game he played rook to d1, this simply loses the pawn. Uh, apparently taking with the bishop is a little bit better, but okay, taking with the queen was still quite good. Queen a5 was a big blunder because I can give the queen up. This was the brilliant move apparently. Uh, and so we're not really losing material. I mean, it's a queen. We got a pawn, a rook, and a bishop. That's nine points. We gave up a queen. That's nine points. But the biggest thing here is that uh, we can play bishop d3 and also win the knight. Once we win the knight, then we are just ahead material for sure. And here we're firmly better. White gets themselves checkmated and they lose the game. So yeah, so I think that this particular episode uh, is a really good one in regards to specifically uh, looking at different types of pawn structures in the middle game, how to play around those for both white and for black. We were able to outplay our opponents from these kind of equal or very, very, very small advent, advent, uh very small advantage type positions um, because we understood the pawn structure and how to play around it better than they did. And the way that you get better at understanding pawn structures is really through uh, kind of, I would say kind of a knowledge base. Uh, what I mean by that is let's say like you can read books on certain pawn structures, like a great book for instance is one written by uh, Mauricio Flores Rios, it's a, uh, who's a grandmaster, he wrote a book called, I think it's called Chess Structures, A Grandmaster's Guide. That book is great for understanding pawn structures from all different types of openings and all different types of middle games. Uh, there's also a really good course on chess.com, uh, one of their chess mentor courses that was made by Grandmaster Johan Helston, I believe. I think it's called Every Pawn Structure Explained or something like that. That's also a very good course that I've taken a look at myself in the past. Um, and then also just from experience in your own games. You know, if you play a game, you get a certain type of pawn structure in the game, try to analyze the game or, you know, think about what both players should be doing. Uh, use, you can use the engine as well, see what the engine recommends, try to kind of figure out why certain moves are recommended or certain moves are not recommended. And um, yeah, it's really just from like growing your knowledge, gaining more experience that helps you to understand the pawn structure better. So anyways, though, that is going to be it for our third game of this episode. This is the 1900 to 2000 rating range. This particular third opponent was over the rating uh, of 2000. Uh, I may continue a little bit further along. I'm still going to make more videos on the French defense, no doubt about that. Uh, but in terms of the speedrun, I'm not 100% sure if I'll continue it past 2000. Um, but I will still make more videos on the French defense, so you don't have to worry about that. Hopefully you've enjoyed this series. If you haven't seen all the episodes and you want to see the earlier episodes in the series, uh, or if I add potential episodes in the future, uh, the playlist is going to be here to the left uh, on top of the board. Uh, so hopefully you've enjoyed this video, and I'll see you around in a future one. Hope you have a good day.